Armed with a hammer and a screwdriver for protection, a terrified couple hurry to a public telephone. The time, six o'clock in the morning. The date, October the 7th, 1965. The place, a Manchester Overspill Council estate. Which service do you require? Police, there's been a m murder. A few hours earlier, the youth, 17-year-old David Smith, had witnessed the brutal murder with an axe of another teenage boy at the nearby home of his sister-in-law. What unfolded from Smith's call to police was to shock a nation and unveil a series of murders which were to become the most notorious in British criminal history. Whole generations have grown up unaware of the horror of what happened 35 years ago and for many who do remember, the precise details have evaporated in the mists of time. For the first time on television, we tell the complete, up-to-date story of child killers Ian Brady and Myra Hindley. Tonight and in the following two programmes, we trace the sadistic killing spree which led to police combing the moors for bodies. And how, after 20 years of silence, confessions by the pair brought about a second search and further evidence of their brutality. The story is told by the mothers of the victims and the detectives involved. I was a young detective constable um, stationed at Hyde on the 7th of October 1965 uh, when I was called out uh, about half past seven in the morning uh, to be told that there had been a murder committed at 16 Waterbrook Avenue, Hattersley, the night before. The body was still believed to be in the house uh, and also the occupants were in possession of firearms. Bob Talbot, the superintendent, he in actual fact was in uniform uh, and we spotted a um, bread man who was in the area with his white coat and his basket. Uh, Bob Talbot went and borrowed the white coat and the basket from the bread man and he then walked um, along the walkway and when he knocked on the door, the door was answered by Myra Hindley. When we got into the lounge and there's a man in his underclothes in bed in the lounge and that turned out to be Ian Brady. He was told why we were there and uh, Bob Talbot and Alec Carr went to search the upstairs. The bedroom door was locked. Hindley told us that she kept her firearms uh, and where the key wasn't available. I suggested that we could always get into the bedroom by forcing the door. I think probably that Brady by that time realised that nobody was going to go away and he turned around to Hindley and said you better give him the keys. She then produced the keys, uh, Mr Talbot and Alec Carr went upstairs and found the body of Edward Evans who was in one of the bedrooms trussed up in a fetal position in a plastic bag. Hindley's brother-in-law David Smith, the youth who made a 999 call to police, had been deliberately lured to Wardlebrook Avenue by Hindley to witness Brady axing Edward Evans to death. By implicating him in the murder, Brady's intention was to gain control over Smith. Brady and Hindley tried to coerce David Smith into being involved in the murder of Edward Evans, and they misjudged the whole scenario. They really thought they were going to get a hold on Smith, and it didn't happen. When Smith had been interviewed during the early hours of that morning, he had insisted that not only had they committed the murder of Edward Evans, they had committed other murders. No one at that stage could imagine the horror that those other murders would reveal, nor that police would begin to unravel the inexplicable disappearance of four young children in the Manchester area in the previous two and a half years. Myra Hindley's childhood was very normal. It was working class Manchester childhood. She grew up in Gorton. She was very much loved. She was part of a very normal working class family. There wasn't a lot of money around, but then there wasn't a lot of money around in any of her neighbours and friends and peer groups. The Gorton area was slums, really. Uh, there was two up and two down, um, no baths, outside toilets. Uh, everybody certainly the people that I grew up with all lived in the same circumstances. A very, very close-knit community, really. The whole street, everybody knew everybody and everybody knew everybody's going on and uh, what they did and the good things and the bad things. And if a stranger came down, of course, they, 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 
oh, taboo, don't speak to strangers. But of course, if it was somebody who lived in the area and knew everybody, they were accepted without question. Henley knew the area specifically. They knew everybody in the area. Knew the streets, what went on in the area. And of course, the, the, the children would be taken in. In contrast to Mary Henley, and Brady's childhood was terribly dysfunctional and extremely unhappy. He's the illegitimate child of a Glasgow waitress. He doesn't know who his father is or was. And so he created around himself this myth of the outsider. He dressed differently from the other boys of the time. He adopted other interests, classical music, classical literature, which he read, and considered himself altogether different from the sort of rock and roll teenagers that were growing up around the Gorton area of Manchester. I knew Ian Brady. He can only be described by me as being an oddball in the sense that uh, he was a loner. If we went to the local um, Sivoris Cafe, uh, he would never join our company, but it was as though he wanted to join the company, and he'd sit on his own in the corner, keep himself to himself. Uh, he, he was just strange, and I thought no more of it in them days. He had fantasies about killing. I think these would have remained fantasies had he not met Myra Hindley, who facilitated it for him, and also egged him on. They formed, if you like, an unholy alliance. He became increasingly dependent on those fantasies, and she encouraged it, and eventually led children to him and effectively led them to, to their deaths. The precise details of how Myra Hindley fulfilled Brady's fantasies remained unknown for 20 years after they were jailed for life. Then, in 1986, Peter Topping, the head of Greater Manchester CID, persuaded the pair to break their silence and for the first time, Hindley detailed her version of events. To come to each one of the events um, as they unfolded, um, the first victim was Pauline Reed. Brady told Henley that he wanted to do one, he wanted to do a murder. On the Friday, the 12th of July, 1963, uh, Pauline was looking forward to this dance. Oh. Yeah? Can you help with my hair? Just a minute. Just dry my hands. A friend was going with her, and then for some reason or other, a friend couldn't go. Mary, it's not a mess, it's a lovely. Pauline was very upset. She didn't think she'd be able to go because I didn't want her to go on her own. I said, I'll get you ready. Go round to other friends and see if they'll go. Mum, she said, uh, Sandra and Pam said they may be going up and they'll see me, you know. So I'll be all right. So I said, so with that, she convinced me and I let her go, or as I wouldn't have let her go on her own. Can you put your shoes on now as you go into the light? I got her ready before she went out, done her hair and everything. She looked beautiful, even her father commented on it, you know, how beautiful she looked. I want you to wear this. Um, before she went out the door, I put my necklace round her neck. She said, oh, Mum, that's your favourite necklace. I said, well, you're my favourite girl, aren't you? And she said, oh, well, we'll look after it. Kids were safe. If a kid was missing, uh, sort of a you and cry had go up and all the neighbours had come out and searched the area and find them. And uh, it had only because they'd lost all track of time that kids were missing in them days. It, it was certainly a very safe environment. I went out with her and I stood at the top of the road and I watched her disappear. She waved to her as she went round the corner. Brady had the impetus to kill. Myra saw herself enabling this man that she loved to do the things that he particularly wanted to do, and in his case, that involved killing. Pauline could not have been abducted without Hinley. Myra Hinley borrowed a van from a greengrocer. She was to drive this van, and Brady was to follow on his motorcycle. And when he saw a victim that he considered suitable, he would flash the headlights of his motorcycle and Hindley would persuade the person into the van. Hindley realises that the, the young girl is a girl called Pauline Reed. 
Now she knew Pauline Reed and um, she persuades her to go to look for a glove which was one of an expensive pair of gloves which she lost on Saddleworth Moor and that she promised to give her some gramophone records in reward for her assistance. They then drove up to Saddleworth Moor. Brady meets them there. There's an introduction and Brady then says that he will take Pauline up onto the knoll to help him to uh, look for this glove. Some 20, 30 minutes later, Brady comes down and calls her. And she goes up and she sees Pauline, who is then uh, lying on the ground. Um, there's blood coming from her throat. Her clothing's disarranged. She's making a terrible gurgling sound. Pauline had had a throat cut. He then told her to go back to the van. Eventually, he comes back down. They lift the motorcycle into the van and drive away. She believed that Pauline had been sexually interfered with as a consequence of the disarray of her clothing and the time that Brady had spent with her. The diabolical thing about Myra Hindley is that after the first killing and up to then, we can perhaps excuse her in that she did not think he would go through with it. But after the first death, she had the ability to cry stop and, and call the whole thing off and it could have ended there. John Kilbride. Brady, according to her, wanted to do another one. The children played out and then John tormented his brothers and sisters and I said, please go to the cinema, John. Stop tormenting your brothers and sisters and don't forget when Pauline Reed was missing, what I told you, whoever did it is only a, a train ride away from here. So always be on your guard. And he, he just grinned, his cheeky grin, and bye, off he went. John spent that Saturday afternoon at the cinema, but instead of going home afterwards, his adventurous spirit took hold. Hey, John, you check us all boxes. Okay. He was hoping on the market, Brown, wasn't he? He never thought he was doing anything like that. But he was earning a bit of pocket money. Yeah. They go to Washington Market and they pick up John Kilbride. Um, the excuse being would he assist them to carry some boxes to the car? He speaks to him first of all. In spite of the warnings, he was too trusting. Especially a lady, because I never warned him about women, you know. There were no, well, I didn't think there were any bad women about. She certainly was the pupil. She became as bad as the master. I don't think she ever became worse than Brady, because the bottom line is that the actual killing was carried out by him. But she allowed the killing to happen. She created the killing, and she gloried in it. She accepts that when the boy was picked up from Ashton Market, that she knew that Brady was going to kill him. A 12-year-old, bright little lad, sees her, obviously then, is not concerned, jumps in the car, and of course, he's driven up onto a saddle of more, where he then is subjected to abuse. Well, he didn't come home at half past six, I thought. He stayed in the cinema to watch it run, which he could in those days. It carried right on. She drops them off on Saddleworth Moor. Brady then walks down the moor with a little lad. And the arrangement is that he's been away about half an hour. She's to flash her headlights three times. He's going to respond with the torch. He's going to come back, get in the car, and they're going to drive away. When Brady comes back to the car, he was carrying a shoe and he had a string and he said he'd, he had a knife that he was going to stab him but the knife was blunt and in the end he'd strangled the boy with the string. He tells her that he'd pulled the clothing down and he'd smacked the boy. She asked him had he abused the boy and he said something about what does it matter or something of that nature but led her to believe from conversation or body language that indeed that had happened. The killings triggered all Brady's sexuality. It was His sexuality is tied up in sadism and violence. And Myra Hindley, as his partner, 
also got a tremendous sexual high out of seeing him so aroused. When we moved to Keith Bennett, Brady had again decided that it was time to do another one. I lived at this house at 29 Eston Street, 1964, the 16th of June, when my son, the oldest lad, disappeared. I gave him his tea, I washed his face, and I said, are you clean? He said, yes, ma'am. I took him out. I was going to bingo, and the two girls were coming with me. We walked up Eston Street onto Hathers Age Road. From Hathers Age Road, we crossed Plymouth Grove West, where the school he used to go to as a baby. I walked up to Stockport Road and seen him across the zebra crossings. I said, I'll see you in the morning. Behave yourself for your gran. And that was the last I'd seen of him. By this time, they had a mini pickup. Hindley says that she's driving along uh, with on, Brady in the back of the pickup and that he knocks on the cab when he sees this young lad walking possibly along Grey Street. The boy's persuaded into the car uh, to give them some assistance with some boxes or something of this nature. He gets into the vehicle and they drive up to okay. Saddleworth Moor. Keith and Ian Brady set off walking onto the moor um, and she followed. Didn't he question where he was going? I asked. No, and she said they went like lambs to the slaughter. She says that she followed them down the moor. They walked for quite a considerable way into the moor. Um, Brady goes into this gully with the boy and she says that she was instructed to uh, be lookout. She said the boy was killed in this gully. He took a photograph of, of the child. Clothing was pulled down, showing that the, the poor lad had uh, quite dreadfully been, suffered some sexual abuse. He buried the body with a spade. She then went on to describe the abduction and the murder of Leslie Ann Downey. I think everybody loved Leslie. She never gave cheek. I never had to smack her. She always done the sisterhood. She came in from school overnight. She'd go up, change out a uniform, make a bed, come down, do her homework. She was, well, every mother says she's perfect, but she was perfect. Hindley says that they went to do some shopping at a supermarket where there was um, drink being offered at reduced prices. And they did the, some shopping and then they went on to this fun fair. <laughs> Mrs. Clark's going to the fair and she'll have six months the old child happy, uh, Leslie. And she said, can I go with them? I said, as long as you're back here, madam, be a tea. Throughout this fun fair, um, some of the shopping is dropped. They ask this little girl who they see to assist them to pick up the shopping and carry it back to the vehicle. They offer to give the little girl some reward. Leslie Ann um, agrees to pick up the shopping, goes back to the vehicle. I was listening to you, Eddie, and we're seeing the friends come back. 
and my son Tommy, he said, uh, "Is Leslie come home, Mum?" I said, "No, she's not with the girls. Go and see Sir Mrs. Clark." He went on there looking. So I said to him, "Tommy, where's Leslie?" He said, Mum, she's crying. She's not on the fair and she didn't go with Mrs. Clark. She went with Mrs. Clark's two daughters. I was hysterical. And she wasn't there. The boys were crying. They'd all been round with the friends looking for her. They then had a mini traveller. They'd um, traded in the mini pickup. Um, they put her in the back of the car, they bundle some boxes around her, and they drive her then up to Waterbrook Avenue on Hattersley. Clearly, all this was pre arranged because um, there was a tape recorder that had been switched on. Brady wanted to take photographs of the child and that of course could not have happened on Saddleworth Moor. That is the only reason and explanation that they took the child to Waterbrook Avenue rather than went straight up on the moor with the child. They were getting confident I think by this time. Brady was wanting more or they were wanting more. They go into Waterbrook Avenue, Brady goes in with the child and she follows. She's got to put the dogs to one side, she says. She then goes on to describe um, an absolutely appalling set of events where the child is told to undress, the child is bound, the child is gagged. Brady takes photograph of the child in all sorts of different poses. This is a little ten-year-old girl. He tells her to go and run a bath. She sees that the child was bleeding, um, that there's a ligature around the child's neck, and um, that Brady carries the child uh, and puts it in the bath and washes the blood off the child. Um, and then they wrap the body um, in a, a sheet with the clothing, because the child is, is naked and um, they put the body into the back of the Mini Traveller with a view to going up to Saddleworth Moor to bury it. She didn't go like a lamb to the slaughter, as, as Hindley had said the others did. She fought very violently until eventually she was quite horribly murdered. Ian Brady had been arrested for murder after police found the mutilated body of Edward Evans trussed up in a bedroom at a council house in Hyde on the outskirts of Manchester. When we initially arrested Brady and uh, interviewed him, he had admitted the murder of Edward Evans. There was no problem. He made a statement. Brady told police how he and Hindley had gone to Manchester to pick up a youth to satisfy his urge to kill. They went down to Central Station to buy a couple of cans of beer or Coke. Brady appears with uh, a lad who he introduces to her as Eddie and says that he's going to come back to the house for a drink. Evans goes back with them to Waterbrook Avenue. Brady then sends Hindley to get David Smith who lived nearby in a flat with his wife, Maureen. And Maureen, of course, was Myra Hindley's sister. She said, Ian wants to see you. He went in there and there was this young lad sat on the city. You know, social sort of gathering. Smith didn't know why he'd been brought there, but he sat down and he was introduced to Edward Evans and uh, Hindley sat down in one of the chairs opposite them. And then Brady got up, walked through, towards the kitchen and then came back through the door, walked behind Edward Evans, lifted his hands up in the air as high as he could go and brought the axe straight down on top of Edward Evans. For what reason? Because of pleasure. Just for their pleasure. 
that this little lad lost his, his life. Evans is slumping to the ground and Brady gets a piece of electric flex which he's going to use to finish off um, Edward Evans. The body then is, uh, is wrapped up in, in polythene. There's some cleaning up which takes place in the house because the room is full of blood and they've come to the conclusion that it would be difficult for them to take the body there and then and bury it. Fortunately uh, for us all, David Smith went home. He woke his wife Maureen, explained to her what had happened and the next morning they go to a call box and telephone the police. David Smith was very cooperative. He had obviously had no intention to get involved in any murder, and anybody who's ever spoken to the lad will appreciate that, that he, all he wanted to do was to tell us everything he could do to assist us. Now, during that course of the conversation, there was a mention made of suitcases. Brady and Hindley emptied the house of anything that incriminating um, from any of their previous murders and they took it away so as that if they happened to be caught, they would only get caught and prosecuted on one. Sergeant Alec Carr said to him, well, what's in the suitcases and where did they spend the time? And he then started to say, well, they've got loads of films and various books and um, Nazi memorabilia and things like that. So then, well, where did they talk about going? And a mention was made of the railway stations. It was almost a passing reference, but Jock Carr latched onto it and he said, I've spoken to a lad of the British Transport Police. And he says he'll check all the life luggage offices for anything that has gone in there prior to last Thursday. So with a bit of luck, we may in actual fact find um, these suitcases that Smith is adamant that are there. Carl said, we've had seven long days and long nights home. So we all went home. And about, I'd been in about an hour, an hour and a half, phone rang. It was Alec Carr. They found the suitcases. They're in Manchester. We'll go and get them. They were big suitcases and they were jam-packed full of stuff. Not, no, not a few bits and pieces in there. I mean, they were bloody heavy. Obviously, the word had got out that we had got suitcases uh, within, if you like, within the police network. And uh, the phones rang. And by about 10 o'clock in the morning, I think every senior police officer in the northwest of um, England descended on Hyde Police Station. We then started to go through the contents of the suitcase. It was like opening Pandora's box. It was all there. It was an answer to a detective's dreams. There was pornographic magazines as market is sad. It really was the key that really identified what Brady and Hindley's involvement had been we got a telephone call from Cheshire Force. They, they had in custody a man for murder and amongst the possible evidence was an exercise book. In that exercise book was a name, John Kilbride. John Kilbride went missing from home. He had been one sided down to the market in Ashton. He was helping the stallholders for a few pennies, pocket money. But this particular Saturday, John didn't return home. And as the weeks went by, and the months went by, it became apparent that something quite dreadful must have happened to him. I had a funny feeling about it. I didn't think I'd see him again. I, I just knew he wouldn't have run away or anything like that. Whoever it was in Hyde spoke to DCI, Joe Mouncey, so he came through to our office and said, come on, Pat, we'll go and see them, see what it's all about. On the table in the CID office were all kinds of books, there were papers. We came across a photograph of a little girl who was tied up. She was gagged by the scarf round about her face. She was lying naked on a bed. That wasn't something that was acceptable. That really was something that immediately corroborated Smith's story. There was a tape, um, and the tape was of a little girl being tortured, um, 
and been abused, the tapes were played to senior investigating officers and it was very hard for these officers to hide their emotions, these hard-nosed policemen. But I can tell you there was a few tears in that room when it was played to these officers. I heard the tape many, many times and it was probably more horrendous the, the more you heard it the more you could pick out because bear in mind it, uh, modern technology is quite different now isn't it um, the more you could understand what was being said and it, it didn't improve it got worse the horror of it the tape runs for some 16 minutes and listening to it is quite horrendous you've got this child who's not wanting to have her clothes taken off. You've got a pleading all the time for a mother. They said to me, we've got some tapes. I said, tapes? What do you mean, tapes? They said, tapes and the voice. I thought, no, please God, no. <laughs> Don't let it be Leslie. And they put her on. And it was Leslie and she's crying for me. Let me go up to Mama and Daddy. And I won't say anything, I don't. I don't know you. And I won't say anything, just let me go to Mama and Daddy. And it was Leslie screaming on the tape. It is absolutely um, horrendous to listen to. It would move the hardest of people. And it very much shows the sort of callousness um, of Brady and Hindley and the way that they actually went about committing the murders that they were involved in. And she was clearly there and was telling the child to be quiet and, and to shut up the child knows that something very serious is going to happen to her. She's begging, she's pleading. It didn't make any difference. They went ahead and did what they did. Joe said, there's more to this than a straight up and down Brady, Evans murder. And from then on, he got his teeth into it and he wouldn't let go. He was like a terrier with a a rat. <laughs> he was wanting to get to the bottom of where these children had gone. And then of course when the photographs were found of various strange places, strange photographs, pieces on the moor, he spent hours and hours on the moors with Ray Gelder, Mike Mashida and various other officers trying to trace the exact location of these photographs. There were a large number of uh, photographs found in the house and in the suitcase and photographic negatives. Some of the photographs were taken with Brady and Hindley and Moreland scenes in the background. It was very, very important that we started to identify all these scenes with the possibility, the very strong possibility, that areas in them depicted possible graves. Brady and Hindley never wouldn't tell us where any bodies were and we did an awful lot of searching on the moors. I must say that it's down to Mountie that kept us going for weeks and end, walking the hills and searching for graves. We walked for miles over those moors, teams of us, but it wasn't just one or two of us, there were whole hordes of policemen. The police have been searching the moors for several days without any success. And on Saturday the 16th of October, 1965, Joe Mounsey decided to bring the lads from the Ashton Division up to make a search. Using the old-fashioned way that was done then, metal prodding rods, pushing them into the ground. No findings were made at all, and it was decided to wrap the job up. All the policemen were going back to the vans to be taken home. And left, Bobby said, I've got to go to the toilet. The sergeant said, well, you hurry up. 
and he dashes back up the hill and as he looks down there's a piece of bone sticking through the through the soil and it's hey Sarge and I went back up and it looked like a sheep bone on returning back down to the other officers my attention was drawn to depression in the peat this depression was filled with water protruding out of the water was what looked like a white weathered stick on making an examination I saw it was a bone but I couldn't tell a bone of what either sheep or human due to the colour of the water you couldn't see anything but I could definitely feel something under the water and I decided then that I would call the other officers up the coach was loaded up and ready to go and they were shouting to me that it's time to go and I said no there's something up here I'm staying I'd found something and I was not leaving the moor until it was uncovered so we gradually moved the soil away gently and upon finding a piece of material realised it was clothing and we knew it was a human body not a sheep and I drove up there and walked up the hill to a, a large group of detectives it was a very bad night uh, it was very eerie, very like a Hitchcock film with all this mess swelling around and it was cold and it was wet. And when we got there, there was big arch lights on pointing towards what looked like um, a very shallow grave. No more than two feet deep, not very long. Uh, in the grave, there was a body of a girl. You could see that it was a girl lying on its back. One half of the body was obviously lying against the peat and the other half of the body was lying against what appeared to be mud. The part that was lying against the mud, there was nothing there, there was no clothes, there was no, no features, nothing, it had absolutely gone. And the part lying against the peat, all the features were there, all the clothes were there, the hair was there, very easily to identify that from the, the picture that we had that was Leslie Ann Downey. They took me to the morgue and I knew it was Leslie, I could tell. Oh God, I saw half of Leslie because there's only half of her there. I wanted to get over her and touch her, they wouldn't let me touch her. I wanted a cutting of her hair, they wouldn't give me one. I was being sick all the time. I was with the but I didn't want to leave her. If we hadn't found the body, I don't know what would have happened, really. They might have got away with it. Mary was a hard, arrogant woman. She had no compassion for children. She had nothing. She wouldn't say anything. She would not talk. She wouldn't answer a question. During the interview, someone put on the table in the interview room a poster of John Kilbride and her lunch was brought in on a tray it was put in front of her on top of but so she could see the John Kilbride poster that didn't have any effect on Mara she just was an emotionless female she could open her heart and told us the whole story of what had gone on from start to finish but she didn't and she wouldn't. And everything had to be proved and the breakthrough was finding the body of Leslie Ann Downey. When we found the photographs of Leslie Ann Downey standing on a bed, naked, legs apart, hands outstretched, clothed in nothing but a pair of socks and wearing a gag with a terrified look in her eyes, we realised that if we could link the bed head in the back bedroom at 16 Wardlebrook Avenue, 
with the bed head revealed in the photographs, this would be a major breakthrough. It would mean that Brady and Hindley knew of the whereabouts of Leslie Ann Downey. I'd already found Myra Hindley's fingerprints on the photographs, so we had to then do a comparison with the bedhead in the photograph and the bedhead in the back bedroom. This was done in the same way as you would do a fingerprint comparison. They were able to match marks up on the wall and the bedhead with marks in the photograph of Leslie Ann Downey. That, of course, proved that that photograph was taken in that room. Having found that similarity, of course, that meant that the fingerprints revealed on the photograph identified as those of Myra Hindley, placed the photographs in Wardlebrook Avenue, placed the bed revealed in the photographs in Wardlebrook Avenue, which showed that they must have had complete knowledge of the photographs, the room and Leslie Ann Downey. Since Brady and Hindley had photographed each other near the grave of Leslie Ann Downey, Police believed the couple must have pictured themselves on other graves. They had a hunch that finding the exact location of one photograph in particular could lead them to the discovery of a second body. Another photograph which was very, very interesting was a photograph of Myra Henley kneeling on the moorland with a puppy dog in her coat, staring down at a patch of which looked like recently disturbed ground. The trick was to find this scene. I got a telephone call at Ashton Underline Police Station. Get yourself and your camera up to the moors and don't be followed. When I got there, I was given the photograph, the uh, picture of Myra and Holland Brown Knoll. Look at that and see if it means anything to you. As I walked around, I suddenly realised I did lit upon the absolutely same spot. That's when I took another photograph showing the foreground and the background of Holland Brown Knoll and matched it up with a photograph. And those two photographs together are quite a picture because the only thing that's missing from my photograph is Hindley and the puppy. The next thing to do, of course, was to establish that uh, it was a grave. The infamous bamboo cane was prodded into the ground and sure enough, there was a distinctive smell which anybody who searched on the moors could identify immediately. A tentative moving of the earth then discovered a shoe and a foot. A long shallow grave was discovered with uh, a body in which uh, we all knew was going to be John Kilbride. They brought a shoe to me to um, identify, you know, and uh, I knew right away it was John's. I had to go up to the mortuary. The remains were there, but she obviously couldn't identify a body. So she had to identify by clothing. But I knew it was John's shoe, Super Duke, just been mended, chiseled tall. I knew it was his. She was upset. We were all upset. We just hung on to her at the back of the car there, hope. It was terrible. It was her child that was being identified, wasn't it? But there's no child to identify. It's any clothing. They cleaned it up as best we could, but I'll never forget it, that. I'd altered his jacket, I'd altered his underwear, his father's underwear, because I wasn't rich, I couldn't always buy him new. I, I knew it was his. The buttons on the jacket football I'd stitched on myself, and there was no doubt at all. not nice to look back on that. It was horrendous, that murder. And particularly when you see pictures of a woman, which you later learn, is a woman standing over the grave of a child that's just been buried. Just dumped like a bag of rubbish in the moors. It's, it's horrific. And then to hear the, the tapes of a child screaming and crying for its mummy. Stop. <laughs> I was there, a 
on the day the jury went out and I was there on the day that the jury returned and found them guilty. The judge sentenced them to life imprisonment. The death penalty had been abolished uh, and they had written into the new act the fact that the judge had the discretion to place a tariff upon the life sentence. In other words, he could say they served a minimum of 15, 25, 30 years. But the judge made no reference whatsoever to any tariff. And I've got to say that when the judge said, put them down, got up and went out, the first thing they said, well, what's the tariff? What are they going to get? And we approached the barristers and they eventually went and spoke to the judge. And the judge told them that he had sentenced them to life imprisonment. And life imprisonment was life. 28-year-old Ian Brady was sentenced to life for the murders of Edward Evans, John Kilbride, and Leslie Ann Downey. Hindley, aged 23, received life for the murders of Edward Evans and Leslie Ann Downey, and seven years for being an accessory after the fact in the killing of John Kilbride. Part of the uh, trial was designed uh, by Brady to exonerate Myra Hindley and so thereafter they kept silent uh, about the fact that first of all Myra was involved in those killings that were public knowledge and that secondly there were other children buried on the moors. There was a conspiracy of silence which Br Brady was willing to um, keep faith with because he believed that Myra loved him. So he was not willing to spill the beans about her implication in the, the murders. So for the 20 years between the trial and the day that I knocked on his door in Gartry and introduced myself, they maintained this fiction that there were no other bodies on the moors, that uh, Myra was actually innocent of the deaths. That's why when there were attempts by the police to determine whether other children were victims of uh, Brady and Hindley, they got nowhere because Brady certainly wasn't going to cooperate with them and Myra was by now so convinced of her innocence that uh, it was going to take some major shattering experience to break through the myths that she had created around herself that she was actually innocent. So I had the uh, bizarre experience of sitting alone in a cell with the notorious Moore's murderer talking about his experiences and uh, gradually bringing him round to talking about to reliving those terrible years uh, where they were actually out on the killing spree. Then it came the day to publish the uh, awful truth that Brady had admitted that he had killed other children, that they were still buried on the moors and that Myra was implicated. Myra was furious because I had actually been able to document to a degree her guilt in a murder that uh, she had claimed to be innocent of. The Home Office and the Director of Public Prosecutions asked Greater Manchester Police if they would inquire as to whether or not there was any substance in the claims. Resources had to be made available to Mr Topping in manpower and money so that he could finally determine were there other children up there and if so, where are they? Given that we were some 20 years on from the events that had happened in the 60s, people's memories were fading and the first thing I had to do really was to make arrangements to see Brady. The man wasn't well, clearly. He was um, in a very, very poor physical condition, very thin, very gaunt, very agitated, constantly walking about his cell. I left with the impression that in the right circumstances, perhaps, he may have spoken more about events surrounding the disappearance of Pauline Reed and Keith Bennett. But um, my concern then was, where did I go from there? I wanted to go and see Myra Hindley. Myra Hindley 
had always remained steadfastly silent about her role in events. She was claiming that she really was the innocent, the young girl who had been misled by Brady and had had a passive rather than an active role in any of the murders, if indeed at all. And she just got caught up with him and her guilt was a consequence of his actions. And so I went to see her in November of 1986. I was told by the staff that she will see you, she'll be polite with you, she'll listen to what you've got to say, but really don't expect any help. We don't think that you're likely to be successful. But I went to see her because I wanted the fact that I'd gone there to become known to Brady. She had told me that she'd received a letter a few days before from uh, Mrs Johnson, that's Keith Bennett's mum, appealing for help in locating the grave or any information surrounding the disappearance of her son. She seemed quite moved by this letter. I made it very clear to her that I couldn't offer her any immunity. I made it very clear to her that I couldn't assist her in any, any sort of parole whatsoever. And she equally accepted this. We came to the point when she formally confessed. I think she finally unburdened herself because she, the new solicitor she had, um, Michael Fisher, actually managed to get it through to her that she was going to be in prison endlessly and without any hope of reprieve unless she confessed that people outside prison did not believe the protestations of innocence and never would believe it. He persuaded her that the only way was to unburden herself, make a clean breast of it, present herself in the best possible light, but get on board that she had committed the crimes, get that out of the way, and obviously not expect immediate release, but look, looking long term to the future, that was the only way she was ever going to get out of prison. She was concerned that a detailed search was starting within a few days of the moor, and I think she was concerned about Brady. She knew we'd seen Brady in Gartree. Uh, she knew our plan to see Brady again, and I think she wanted to get in first on that. She took her time, was very controlled, and told me how each of the victims had been abducted or persuaded to be brought to the scene of their subsequent murders. It was really an extremely and well-rehearsed performance from her, though in doing it, the information that she was giving me was certainly placing her uh, as a principal in the offence of murder. She just wanted to tell me about each of the victims, how it had happened, and give as much information as she could, which would help us to recover the bodies of the missing victims, Pauline Reed and Keith Bennett. What she did say, and this is what brought the turnabout of events quite dramatically to the inquiry that I was then conducting, was that she would be willing to go to Saddleworth Moor to point out areas of interest. I was hoping that we could have brought her to the moor without any real publicity. She was flown up by helicopter onto the moor. The weather was very poor, there was a lot of snow blowing around and the media in their anxiety to cover the event fully caused me a great deal of problems. I didn't want a media circus around me when I was trying to, 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 to get from her the information I needed. And it was done um, against a back cloth of driving wind, of snow blowing about, of helicopters circling overhead and a woman who had been in prison for 20 odd years who was, to be fair, a little confused. Brady um, was somewhat different. Um, Brady, when he confessed, would only talk about two murders and that was Pauline Reed's and Keith Bennett's. He wouldn't talk about the other murders that he'd been convicted of. My interviewing of Brady was totally different to that of Myra Hindley. He would not um, allow me to have another police officer with me. He would not allow me to take notes. And I spent probably more hours with Brady than I did with Hinley. He would always talk around the events. I was always seeking to persuade him to assist me to point out these grave sites. Brady 
um, was always wanting to have control of the situation. He would always want to put on conditions as to what he wanted in return. Um, he first of all wanted his solution, um, and his solution was that I too came up onto Saddleworth Moor. He pointed out the two sites, which he said he could do without any trouble or difficulty very quickly, and then he was brought back to the prison and was given the means to kill himself. Now, he said this in front of me. He said this in front of me when I was with his solicitor. Clearly a nonsense. He knew that that was impossible. Eventually, Brady dropped his demands, but his visits to the moors proved fruitless. With the passage of time, the terrain had changed and the police were unable to find anything. But they were to have more luck after a second visit by Hindley. The next time that she came up was in March of 87. Um, she was brought up by road. And by that time, she'd confessed. Of course, it was somewhat different. Um, I managed to get her onto the moor without the media being aware of it. We could then discuss the murders. We could discuss what had happened, where it had happened, where she'd parked her vehicles, where the boy, Keith Bennett, was taken onto the moor. We believed, as did other people who had had anything to do with this case, that the victims had been killed in houses, not on the moor, and had been taken up on the moor and carried onto the moor and buried. The terrain on the moor is very difficult to walk on. To be carrying a body and walking on the moor is extremely difficult. And given that Leslie Ann Downey's body and John Kilbride's body had been found within 100 yards of the road near Holland Brown Knoll, we assume that that would be the case in connection with any bodies that had been buried there. The pattern of the systematic search was that every area that we searched, and before we searched it, we logged it, was to take the layers of the earth away, which would show whether there'd been any disturbance of those layers, and we would know right away whether or not there'd been any digging in those areas. Topping concentrated part of his search around an area called Holland Brown Knoll, where 20 years earlier, police had found the body of Leslie Ann Downey. We had searched Holland Brown Knoll very thoroughly, and we were getting away from what we considered to be the hot spots, if you like, as to where we might find the body. She worked very hard trying to locate areas which she was saying at that stage were of significance. She didn't sort of spare herself in any way, shape or form. Um, I have to say that she did all that she possibly got, could to uh, assist me to locate those two graves. I discussed with her in detail the night in question and she could recall, which she'd never said before, that when she'd been on the moor near where Pauline was, she could see rocks silhouetted against the night sky. Now that took you further back into the moor on Holland Brown Knoll and so we then were concentrating on the grassland behind the peat beds and of course we found um, the grave site of Pauline Reed which in many ways wasn't um, something that we were overjoyed about, we were saddened by it. But nevertheless, it gave us a great deal of um, feeling of fulfilment, of having achieved an objective which we never really hoped we could have uh, achieved at one stage of the inquiry. Certainly when we set out, we didn't. But the body was remarkably well preserved. I certainly had no doubt in my mind that it was Pauline from the clothing, from the shoes. On the day that she went missing, I understand that she'd bought uh, a pair of white to high heel court shoes. Like a lot of her personal effects, the court shoes were in pristine condition. All the gold writing which is stamped on the inside of ladies' court shoes, or certainly was in those days, was as though it, it showed as though it had just come out of the box. It was sparkling. I was in hospital at the time and I had her shoes brought to me. It was a terrible feeling. Out of my mind I was, really. It was a dark world. 
I always had a living hope that she was about somewhere. I never thought that she was dead or anything happened to her in any way. I had that living hope that she was alive and walking about somewhere, you know, and uh, I was always looking. I was, I even done Avon's job. So going from house to house, thinking of find her in one of the houses. I was always ready with my coat on to run out as soon as daylight came. I we went miles on my own, travelling, you know, on the buses and everything, and thinking I'd seen her and running after, getting on one bus and I'd be running after that bus. To... I never thought Mara Henley or Ian Brady was to do with it at all, because her sister was a near neighbour, lived next door but one, Maureen. And she went visiting there. Mara Henley was talking to me normally and saying she was sorry about Pauline knowing she'd done that I didn't think to laughter you know it's, it all came back to me what was what I would sum the pair of them up as evil Brady ill mentally ill Myra Henley so intrinsically evil that she was prepared to go along with his what should have been obvious as an illness and at the bottom line you can't make excuses you can't mitigate you have to say that they committed crimes that were evil beyond belief beyond anything that that the rest of us can even contemplate today we have of course the facilities to quite easily video and take pictures and movies make movies of um, various things in the home it's readily accessible. But when you look and see what they, Hindley and Brady, were doing, that they taped the torture of Leslie Ann Downey. They took still black and white photographs of Leslie Ann Downey being tortured. They're there, she's undressed, she's obviously been hurt, she's crying for help, she wants to get away. Today, I have no doubt that Brady and Hindley would take a film, they would take a video, and they would produce what is commonly termed today as the typical snuff movie. That's what they were doing for their own gratification in 1965. I've spent a lot of time with the case. I've had the benefit of absorbing the work that was done by the officers you know, the excellent work that the officers undertook in the 60s. And of course, I've reviewed the case, I've had the benefit of the confession of Hindley, the very detailed and rambling confession on occasions of, of Hindley. And I've had many hours with her also and with, with Brady. But to sum it up, really what they were about was just pure evil. They set out to... Um, abduct and murder small children and without her help and cooperation and her probably pleasing manner um, none of this could have taken place and if she took no greater part in it than to what she's confessed and let us accept that she really was and is a very very evil woman For a long time, I put an extra plate out, counting the seven children, you know. And uh, I bought presents the first year after his 13th birthday, but I've still got a card, actually, that I bought them. For every turn, but that day I wrote on the card. It wasn't a good time, that two years. But a big relief when he was found. I'm on 11 tablets on her, sleeping tablets, and I've been on them for 30 odd years. And I can't go to sleep without them. She's always in my mind and in my thoughts. She's not suffering now. Nobody can hurt her now feel her that close now you see so that seems to 
but me up a lot. I feel her so close to me. But I miss her very much, I still do. She's my little girl. They were terrorised and abused and killed in a lonely and inhospitable part of the world. They were taken away from the comfort of their mothers and families. The whole thing is horrendous. One day I will find him because he's up on them walls on his own. They've all been found but him and there's no way I'm going to give up till I find him. And I won't rest till he's found and put to rest in a grave, a proper grave. Winnie Johnson continues to go up there because she naturally and quite rightly understands that to be the graveside of her son. It's very sad that we were not successful in locating Keith and its gravesite. We'll find him one day. If they dig a hole in walls, we'll find it.